Welcome to the opening of the second part of the Meiosis vodcast. Here we're going to jump right in where we left off last time. We had finished by talking about prophase 1 as the chromosomes condense and form their tetrads. Crossing over happens to ensure some greater variation and we're going to jump right in to what happens next in metaphase 1. So here we go. Once prophase one is complete, then we move into metaphase one. This is a little different. This is the piece, okay, where we really see the difference from mitosis. Chromosomes still line up down the middle. However, how they line up the middle is differently. They assort independently. Here is my homologous pair lined up down the middle. Here is my other homologous pair, my third homologous pair. Again, remembering, and if I show it to you here, maybe it'll help a little bit that I'm going to have them hanging out in a tetrad, okay, the four right next to one another, okay. In mitosis, instead of being in that foursome, I would have had one chromosome lined up, the other one right underneath it. So here's my homologous pair lined up together. This is going to prevent um, you know, the wrong chromosome count getting into the new cells. This basically process is going to make sure that only one half is in my new cells at the end of the process. So they line up. It's totally what we call independent assortment. They're going to line up completely randomly, okay? And the direction that the chromosomes will travel in the first division, totally random. So I could have it where they line up like this and then it splits like that or you're going to get all of these different possibilities for options so if you just look at these and then if you imagine that the cell is going to divide in this direction okay so in this case maybe that one goes this way that one goes that way and so on well over here you can see one went into the other direction one went the other way this chromosome pair here separates independently from the other two no one pair dictates the way that a chromosome separates, okay? So if you imagine, it's, it's just random. It's, it's just random. So here's your example here. This is what we call my diploid cell here. It's 2n equals 6, okay? Um, that tells me my diploid count is 6 chromosomes, meaning 3 pairs. And how they arrange is completely random. And this is a huge key to the variation process, okay? And again, reminding ourselves, this is not something that happens in mitosis. This is a big difference. Homologous pairs do not hook up together in mitosis, okay? And what it does is it allows me to create in my new cells the possibility of two to the nth combinations. So if I have, um, you know, three pairs, okay, my n number, three different chromosomes, um, the possibilities I'm going to have for this particular one are two to the third different combinations um, of those particular chromosomes. Again, the lab's going to show this. Then we move into anaphase just from metaphase into anaphase, and the chromosomes are going to separate. So here's my prophase, here's my crossing over event that might occur. Crossing over occurs here. Here is a tetrad, okay, in, in metaphase. Now in anaphase, my tetrad separates. So I am separating the homologous pair not just two random chromosomes. I'm separating the homologous pair. So one half goes one way. So that's one chromosome. Remember, it and its sister, one chromosome. Goes one way. The other homologous pair goes the other way. And then the other one here and the other pair in this case randomly assorts as well. And then in telophase one, I get my first division. Okay, I get the formation of two cells now, both with half the normal chromosome count. This now is a haploid cell. What I have is one chromosome 
one chromosome. So there are two chromosomes here. It's haploid. It's one half of the original. I had four in my parent cell, even though they're replicated. Okay, remember, this is a one chromosome still. It's just here's a chromatid and here's its sister. Okay, chromosome, its sister. Okay, so at the first end of the first division, I have two haploid cells, two chromosomes, two chromosomes. Now in the second division of meiosis, what we call meiosis two, we skip over the S phase. There's no um, replication again. Okay. Now what I'm going to do though is separate my sister chromatids. You're going to have a prophase two where they're there. They're going to line up on a spindle. My metaphase two now I have one chromosome lined up, I have another chromosome lined up, and in anaphase two, I get the separation of sister chromatids. Okay, and when it's all said and done, I end up with four cells, two chromosomes, N equals two, these are haploid because my original cell that started the process had a 2n equals 4 count. Okay, and that's the end of it. These may go on to become sperm, they may go on to become egg cells, depending on whether you're male or female. So if this were us, humans, at the end of telophase 2 in a human, I would have 23 chromosomes at the end because I would have started at 2n equals 46. So for humans, n equals 23. So at the end of it all, a two division process, I create four cells, they are haploid, okay, and in some cases if you're a male, so this would be if I'm a male, you have the process of spermatogenesis which then those four cells get modified, processed to become sperm, or you have oogenesis in a female that go on and processed to become um, egg cells. Okay, so if I'm a sperm, <laughs> sounds weird. Um, what happens is you start with your first cell, okay, here's my setup, my first division, I separate my homologous pairs, here they're haploid, just to remind us, they divide again, then they, all four, all four cells get processed into actual sperm, and these are called gametes. Okay, so that happens in um, spermatogenesis. Now in oogenesis, this is a little different. First cell division, note size difference. At the first meiosis division, one cell is bigger than the other one. Okay, there's an unequal division of cytoplasm. One cell becomes much bigger than the other. This is what we call the first polar body. This is my secondary oocyte. This is the cell that will eventually go on to become an egg. The first polar body will divide again, creating two polar bodies, both haploid. This cell, right here, will go on to divide two, creating a third polar body and the actual egg cell. So out of oogenesis, three polar bodies discarded, only one becomes the egg. And this is because it has to be so much bigger. There's a lot more energy involved in the egg cell. Okay, so ladies, every cell of ours that goes through meiosis, only one actually becomes a viable egg cell. The other three are tossed. So there's a few things that can go wrong in meiosis that I just want to briefly mention and we'll talk a little bit more about them in class. Um, sometimes when cells go through meiosis, the chromosomes don't separate the way that they're supposed to. Um, sort of the classic example and the one that I think we're probably most familiar with is Down syndrome. Um, named after the doctor who first discovered the, um, the cause of the abnormality. Um, and what it is, is it's a result of a process known as non-disjunction. During meiosis, the chromosomes don't separate. And what ends up happening is one of the gametes ends up having Instead of just one, it has the second as well. So in Down syndrome, it's 
uh, technical name is called trisomy 21. In Down syndrome, um, that individual has three of chromosome number 21 instead of two, like everybody else. So what they get is a triple dose of all of the genes that are found on chromosome 21. And we can show data that actually shows that your risk for having a baby with Down syndrome as a mom um, increases quite drastically the older mom is because the cells um, have been around a lot longer. They're, in essence, older cells. We're born with our egg cells ready to go um, when, when at birth, and then they are arrested in meiosis. And uh, so as mom gets older, the chances that non-disjunction is going to continue or happen is really, really likely, um, especially over the age of 35. Once you hit 35, it really starts to increase. Um, pretty drastically to have a baby with Down syndrome. We're not quite sure how much dad's um, contribution plays a role in. What we can look at is mom. Okay, so this is the idea of non-disjunction. During the first division, during anaphase, instead of this going that way and this going this way, both go that way, leaving me with a cell that has an empty chromosome, leaving this one having two. So that at the end of it, you can see I'm n plus one. So now if this is the egg that meets up with dad's sperm that only has, um, you know, it's only really supposed to have two, right? You can see I'm going to get a triple dose of that particular one. And that's not disjunction. It can also um, be the other way around too, where mom's empty egg here, okay, meets up with dad's sperm that has it. And instead of having two, the baby only has one. Um, Turner syndrome is an example of this. Okay. And sometimes in meiosis too, um, we can have it. It's a little bit different, um, but that's just the process. And so, um, you know, your, your textbook shows and discusses some of these chromosomal uh, disorders that can occur. Okay. But there's a few of them, a lot of trisomies. And, uh, and everything. So uh, that's, you know, basically the process of meiosis. And we're going to explore this pretty heavily in the lab, give you guys a chance to really take a look at it um, and really get down and dirty with it.